And I realized how absolutely essential memories are. You know, we are who we are because of what we learn and what we remember. It's essential to identity. It is our identity. Up until 1938, we had a comparative, comparative freedom. In other words, we were able to go to restaurants, we were able to go to the movies, we were able to go to the theater. We had German and, or I should say, Jewish and non-Jewish friends. And for many, many years, I was not aware that I was different. I was an enthusiastic Boy Scout and a student and interested in playing football. That's about it. And privately, I took French lessons and piano. Not with great success, but... I had a wonderful childhood. I had a grandmother all to myself. I had 13 dolls. I had roller skates. I went to a private school from 19... Uh, 30 to 33, um, called Weinholz Privatschule, and um, where the teachers were called aunt and uncle. And um, it was a mixed school, boys, uh, boys and girls, and non-Jews and Jews. I was proud to be a Jew, and when we had to be as a star, Jewish star, I would never would hide it. I was proud. I said, everybody knows I'm Jewish. Then there came a day, I don't remember any discussion beforehand, when I was told that I could no longer go to that school. Teachers on the, uh, in the corridors, for instance, we had to greet them by raising our hands and saying hi, little. I had a German girlfriend whom I adored. She was everything I was not. She was thin, slim, she had long hair, she wore glasses. And one day, my mother picked us up someplace and she raised her elegant thin arm and said, Heil Hitler, Frau Salinger. There was a billboard sort of in the center of town. Ironically, it was placed right across the street from the synagogue in town and on it, every week were placed pages from a Nazi newspaper called Der Stürmer. And of course, the pages that were shown always showed caricatures of, in addition to articles, caricatures of Jews, which were, uh, for want of a better word at this time, comic because it was so exaggerated. Everything they took away from us. So my father would say, let them have everything. The life they would live, give us, life they wouldn't take from us. We didn't really think that would happen in Austria. Hitler invaded on the 12th of March, 38. And the next thing I remember very vividly is the stormtroopers marching down the narrow street that was at the side of our apartment building. That uh, Nazi march, um, you know, the sound of the boots on the ground of put, can put the fear. And we heard on the radio, which we listened to with, uh, with earphones, um, how in 200,000 people in Heldenplatz welcome Hitler with the most amazing enthusiasm you could imagine. And after the Anschluss, everybody was soon aware of a wave of arrests that took place of anyone who'd conceivably opposed the Nazis. And all of a sudden, they fired all the Jewish assistant associate for professors. There's a chance for you to move up. So this was fantastic for the non-Jewish academics, and they have took full advantage of it. The difference of feeling now to my last um, 
period in Vienna when you couldn't walk on the street without dread of something. You know, this total insecurity of the surrounding population. Um, that proved themselves untrustworthy. She said, let me write to the cousins. So he said, all right. She wrote to the cousins, and by return mail, we had the affidavit for five, for four people, and that's what saved us our lives. I mean, America did not exactly make it easy. That's a myth, the open arms of the Statue of Liberty, I think. That's unfortunately not true. Wasn't true then and is not true now. I recall that when we wanted to leave, people said to my mother, uh, Mrs. Mosheim, this is not really goodbye. It's just temporary. We know you're going to be back within six months or so when all this blows over. And then, of course, came Kristallnacht, and that changed everything. I climbed through the window to see inside, and it was horrible. It was a sight I will never forget. Everything was burned. The Torah scrolls were just thrown in, in, into a bin, and they were half burned. The altar was burned. And I stood there, and I took off a little piece of the Torah, which was against the rules, and a little piece of the altar, and I pasted it in, into my sitter. And I hadn't realized how many stores had been, uh, had been Jewish stores. But they knew which ones were, and, and they just ransacked them. And that had happened during the night when we were sleeping. That morning, after the night of broken glass, the Nazis came to the apartment. Uh, there, were, there was no hitting. Uh, there were, I do remember their big black boots. They told my father to get dressed and to go with him. And I do remember my grandmother. In those days, they had long skirts. I remember my grandmother taking out some money from the seam of her skirt, give it to the Nazi, and say, take good care of my son. My father then went outside and mounted a truck in front of the house. I couldn't see what was in the truck, uh, but I could see him turning around, giving me a smile and a wave, and that was the last time I ever saw my father. I was selected to the last kinder transport to Sweden in August of 1939. The Swedes, <clears throat> You saved my life by taking me in, right? Because if I hadn't gone to Sweden, ultimately, I would, would, I would have ended in a gas chamber. Somebody had the bright idea of having all the kids in the train sing a certain Austrian folk songs, folk song Musiden, Musiden zum Städtle hinaus, which means, must I, must I leave my little town. And I see the comfortable demeanor of the people who are sitting there. You know, they're enjoying life, they feel, they feel connected, they feel this is what they, where they come from, this is what they are, this is where they want to be. And this, this kind of feeling has been taken away from me. I think people never learn. It's still it's going on in the world, but shouldn't be. Truth is that the greedy, uh, power-crazy people have to be watched early on. The fact is that uh, under the right circumstances, you can make people believe in anything because there is a tribal instinct in us 
We want to belong. We want to belong to a group. We want to be suspicious of people who are different, who come from a different place, and that can be exploited by political parties, by demagogues of any kind. The only protection is to have a very strong democratic tradition.